Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. That's right, folks. This is the Grim Leftovers Show. I am Grimnir, and it is Monday, January 28th, 2019. And uh, glad to have you all here with me today for another episode of the Grim Leftovers Show. I'm going to be doing some stories that I like to do here on the show uh, that are leftovers from the Freakers Ball Show. Yeah, stuff I we, we, we just didn't have time to get to. You know, we cover a lot of stuff on the Freakers Ball, and now it's time to cover some of the leftovers right here on the Grim Leftovers Show. We're live on reallibertymedia.com. RLMRadio.xyz. We're there on freedomsnetwork.com, realliberty.org, and we have the tweets sent out all across the Twitter sphere, and of course on the minds.com, realliberty.org. Did I mention them already? I think I did. Anyway, <laughs> we're out there in various places, tunedin.com, internet radio, all over the place. So, uh, anyway, here we are, here we are. It's, um, Time for, an, I don't even know what, the sixth show, I think, sixth episode of uh, Grim Leftovers. Anyway, uh, welcome to everybody over here in the uh, Real Liberty Media chat on irc.freenode.com. we got a great group of folks over here today. We always have a great group of folks here in the chat. Uh, we got Cowboy Tech saying howdy and hi, and Mr. Beetle, and the Moose Girls here with us, Miss Kate, and uh, DC, and Chloe, and Chelsea, Donnie, and Echelon, and Miss Graham Z. Oh, and I be Don Z himself. Yes, indeed, Mr. Meister Brown, unless he's working, which is a possibility. The Poxified Group. I just call him that now. And we got Rain and, the, and uh, Mr. Rob Works and Roams and uh, Vin E, the Phantom Asmo, too. That's right, we got Cyborg Noodle. Cyborg Noodle! <laughs> Dakota and uh, Frumpy. Oh, did I mention Frumpy? Yeah, and, and Vin E, the Gander Ponder. Uh, in Gromit and Java Doctor and JJ's from uh, Scotland and Kozu and Moe and Ensign Dubois. Oh, we got the Pone Sauce in the Sock Puppet and the Skittle in the Uno. You know, Uno? You know, Uno. Anyway, uh, yeah, I guess it's getting ready to be the big deep freeze out across uh, much of the northeast in such areas such as that. Yeah, so uh, stay warm, all y'all out there. Uh, you know, don't wander off too far away from the from where a uh, heated space might be, because uh, you're gonna need some of that heat in this frigid, frigid cold uh, out there. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, yeah, our um, our uh, the, our Real Liberty Media um, annual donation drive officially starts this coming Friday, on February 1st, and we we don't, we don't take a whole lot to keep everything running, you know. Uh, about 300 bucks a year or so. But we're off to a good start already. We've already received a couple donations, uh, fairly healthy donations. Uh, so we're off to a really good start. And it's not even official yet. It don't matter, though, if it's official or not. You can always go to the reallibertymedia.com page and uh, click on the little donate button there. And and uh, that'll send you on over to the place where you can put in your money. Now, some, some people have told me, oh, I don't have a PayPal. You don't need a PayPal. Uh, it, it is it is done through PayPal, but you don't need to have an account on PayPal. Uh, it, it will it will take your uh, credit card information from any card you may have, uh, whether that's a, uh, a Visa, a Mastercard, it could, it could be a debit card. It don't care. Uh, they're 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 pretty uh, liberal in their acceptance policies of cash, um, and that'll come right over to us, and that that'll keep us going. It'll keep our hosting uh, money paid. And it'll keep our domain. Uh, registrations paid. It'll it'll keep our shoutcast server running. Uh, it'll keep all kinds of other little costs that occur throughout the year for various things that we uh, need to here to have things going on. So uh, we appreciate all all and any donations that come our direction in any manner. We also accept Bitcoin and Dogcoin and uh, Dopecoin and. <laughs> Some other cryptocurrencies, so uh, yeah, you can you can feel free. But by the way, though, if you do if you do donate in in a uh, cryptocurrency, uh, send me a little note, let me know, so I can be sure to check those wallets, and and uh, I can see where it's at and who it's, who it came from. That'd be awesome. Uh, so I guess that's all about that. Uh, let me think of anything else here. 
Nope, let's get let's get let's get right to some of the stories that we got lined up here for you today. Oh yeah, these are old stories, I know. Uh but uh that's okay. Uh, that's what that's that's what the show's all about. <laughs> Now this story, although it's uh, initially posted on, uh, well, uh, last updated on February 8th of 2018, um, I found it sometime around November, and uh, so I'm going to share it with you here now. Uh, th- this is on a website called Global Healing Center. Yep, and it's uh, 10 foods high in uh, vitamin D. We like to do a little health stuff here. Yeah, we do. Um, uh, and by the way, uh, speaking of health stuff, I'm getting ready for the first time since I've moved out to this house here. Uh, it'll be, what, 14 years this year? Yeah, 14 years come June. Uh, I'll, I'll have been at this house, and I'm getting ready for the first time in all those years of being here, of, of actually doing a garden in my backyard, growing some actual vegetables and fruits. Um, uh, I, 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 I'm not sure what kind of fruits, but mostly vegetables, I guess. Uh, no corn, but we'll do some... some uh, bell peppers and oh i guess cantaloupe cantaloupe uh green beans uh, uh various other things that i like tomatoes for sure maybe strawberries if i find that i have any strawberry seeds i haven't bought any strawberries so and i, I i've been trying to save seeds from various uh, uh foods fruits and vegetables that i eat um and uh, so yeah I've, I've been doing that so and that and i also have a seed vault that i purchased uh, many years back now um, that I that I can plant for, from those things, uh, some of the uh, heirloom seeds and such like that. Anyway, so I'm getting ready to do that. That'll be the first time this year. Uh, uh, hopefully, hopefully, I got my fingers crossed that I'm going to do it. I'm not sure how to keep the uh, the the uh, critters out of the, there though, uh, so we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. <laughs> anyway, this first article: uh, ten foods high in vitamin D. Yes, that wonderful vitamin D stuff. It says, although we can find many foods in the supermarket that have been fortified with a synthetic form of vitamin D, there are only a select number of foods that naturally contain vitamin D. Normally, the human body makes vitamin D. Uh, Exposure to sunlight is the catalyst for the synthesis of this hormone in the skin. But today, many people spend countless hours indoors and exposure to the sun is limited which by the way uh, that is true for me i'm not i'm I'm not a real big fan of hanging out in the sun but uh as i said i'm going to be doing a garden so or i'm planning on doing a garden let me me get that straight Uh, plans are are not always uh, (laughs) the thing that happens anyway so uh, maybe I'll get more vitamin C this year anyway this may be a cause of many ailments including a depressed mood weak bones with age bones become weak and thin although you can't turn back the hands of time Eh, speak for yourself Uh, anyway good nutrition is one of the best ways to encourage your body uh, to be its best vitamin D is one nutrient in particular nutrient in particular that supports normal bone density and strength um, so anyway the, the top 10 foods containing vitamin D he says here shiitake and button mushrooms I, I don't eat nearly enough mushrooms and I don't think I'll be able to grow those in a garden but then there's a whole bunch of different fish stuff here mackerel sockeye salmon herring sardines catfish tuna cod liver oil and then it gets down to eggs and finally sunshine. Um, so uh, l- l- let me just say, um, the mushrooms, I, I, I don't know how to grow those, but uh, you could buy them at the store, certainly, uh, depending on which store or what, what your store's got. Um, but the dried shiitake mushrooms are very high in vitamin D, and the button and oyster mushrooms are also rich in vitamins B1 and B2. To benefit from the high vitamin D content, make sure you find the mushrooms that have been dried in the sun, not by artificial means. Um, I, I won't go into all the various fish options here too much, other than to say that you have to be careful, because uh, you eat too much fish, you're not only going to get all the vitamin D that you need in the in the, in the omega-3s, the, the fatty acids there, but you're also going to get a, a healthy dose, or an unhealthy dose, I should say, of mercury uh, in most cases. Uh, catfish, you're probably safe on catfish, if that's fresh caught, fresh stream, freshwater catfish uh, because uh, yeah the mercury hadn't gotten into there well eh, 
Uh, I don't want to ex necessarily exclude that, but a lot less mercury there than you're going to get out of the ocean fish. Uh, cod liver oil, um, uh, yeah, that's a tough one, um, but 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 they do recommend it highly. Eggs, I love eggs. Eggs can vi contain vitamin D in small amounts. Eating one egg will provide you with approximately 21% of your daily needs. So unless you're eating five eggs a day, uh, you're going to need to supplement some other way. And he mentions sunshine here, or she, is it he or she? I, I didn't even see who put this up. Uh, Dr. Edward Group. His name is Grope? Okay. His name is Edward. He. <laughs> he says, okay, I know sunshine is not a food, but daily exposure to sunshine can seriously increase your vitamin D levels. In fact, the vitamin is often called the sunshine vitamin. When sunlight hits the skin, it stimulates production of vitamin D from cholesterol. So you got to have enough cholesterol going on in there, too. Uh, this is great news for those of us who can take a daily sun bath. But for those of us who can't, you must boost your intake from the foods you eat. This may explain why the Inuits up there in Alaska eat so much fish. Now, I also want to mention, and, and, I, and I don't have any kind of a link for it, although I'm sure I could find one for you e easily, easily enough, um, for some good vitamin D3 that, that you can purchase as a supplement that is natural. Um <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, so that that's a good thing. Vitamin D. I, I highly recommend it that if you can get that. Um, you know, there's also plenty of other different uh, vitamins that you, that you may want to um, partake in. Anyway, on to the next story here. Um, as I mentioned at the top earlier there, the um, PayPal that we use here or that, that I use and, and that Real Liberty Media uses uh, as, as one of our, our, uh, our, our primary uh, fund collection sources. Uh, a lot of people don't like PayPal for one reason or another or many reasons. Uh, so I, I come to you with a story here from S, oh, Search Engine Journal, SEJ.com, uh, SearchEngineJournal.com, uh, by Christy Kellogg, posted up on October 26, 2008. The top 10, or excuse me, top 18 PayPal alternatives for your business and or for your own personal finance. Uh, it's, it's good to have some sort of thing there. Uh, looking for PayPal alternatives? Well, more than 16 million merchant accounts are in a staggering 65% of market share. PayPal has long dominated the payment processing industry. Still, there is a host of competitors worth exploring when it comes to identifying a payment processing solution that's right for your business. Consider the following. Fees. Yes, fees. That's one of the, the uh, primary reasons for uh, using and or not using a particular payment processing service. Now, with PayPal, if you're a personal account, there's no fees. There's no charge. They just do it. Um, I, I started a uh, business account on PayPal many years back uh, when, when I was doing uh, a lot of eBay and I, and I had a business name and all that great stuff. Um, and, and they do charge a uh, not, not cheap amount, but they are not the most expensive out there. Uh, and and it, it was at that point in time, I think it still is, readily accepted by eBay. Uh, e eBay and PayPal worked uh, hand in hand together. I'm not positive if that still works. I'm going to have to check it out because I do got some stuff I need to eBay this year. And uh, we'll, we'll see how that works out. Uh, so anyway, the amount you pay for processing fees uh, can vary greatly depending on the payment processing service you use and the amount of payments you receive. Also, highly, highly important, data security, which... I, I think that's kind of an oxymoron data security because it doesn't seem to matter uh, where uh, if what what service you're using eventually they all get hacked some have been hacked some haven't but it's a matter of time before those that haven't are <laughs> anyway it says make sure you're working with a reputable company whatever that means with a long history of servicing clients 
do do the due diligence to research how they encrypt and protect data. And then customer service. Not all customer service is created equal. Make sure the company will be there when you need them by looking at their customer reviews. Anyway, it says, but before we dive into the competitors, let's just take a little bit closer look at PayPal. You know, like I said, I've been with PayPal a long time, and, and I, I've never had a problem with them. They've always treated me very well. Um, I, I know people, other people personally, though, that have had problems with PayPal. And, uh, yeah. And also, I, I know that they're part of the, the big group that bans certain people for saying certain things, which is uh, I'm not a fan of. Um, I'm quite against, but, uh, again, uh, they haven't touched me, and I, and I think um, eh, I'll, I'll probably stick with them uh, for a while. Anyway, the payment processing behemoth launched in 1998 in Palo Alto. PayPal is used in more than 200 countries and, the, and charges the industry standard processing fee of 2.9% plus 30 cents per transaction, which is, like pretty much standard no matter where you're going to go um, some are a little bit higher some are a little bit lower but overall it works out uh, pretty close to that your customers are already familiar with PayPal and PayPal is compatible with most shopping cart systems that's talking about website shopping cart systems electronic shopping carts and uh, so uh, yeah it's 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 uh, very widely accepted and, and handy still there may be reasons may be many reasons I can almost be speak <laughs> You're thinking of switching to an alternative, such as contacting PayPal customer service can be challenging. And there's little secrets to do that. So anyway, PayPal seller protection does not extend to digital goods, meaning if you're not actually shipping a physical good to somebody, uh, th there's no protection there. Uh, chargeback fees, um, which, yes, that those, are, those could be hefty. And account suspension leading to frozen funds. And that, that's the big one there is the account, account suspension thing. Anyway, they've uh, uh, reviewed the following 18 all, all, all PayPal alternatives. Uh, Stripe, Square, Shopify, Amazon Pay, Braintree, In, Intuit, Authorized.net. I've used them before, and uh, they were fine for, uh, for doing uh, credit card processing. Um, WePay, uh, to check out ProPay, click to sell Dwala. Payoneer Skrilla, uh, Skrill, not Skrilla, <laughs> Skrill, uh, Klarna, Peza, Merchant, and Payline. Now, rather than, than, than going through each one of these for you, because you, you probably don't, most people here probably aren't doing that much. I'm, I'm going to suggest that um, if you do need a, a personal one, if you don't have one yet, um, you, you might want to go through this list and check out the different things. This is geared towards a, a business setup. Uh, how, uh, however, um, each of them, well, not each of them, uh, I'm, I'm going to say uh, many of them, <laughs> many of them uh, have accounts for personal usage that, that don't have fees uh, and that, that are also good. So, uh, yeah, check out something like WePay or I'm not sure how the Amazon Pay one works. I, I'll have to look into that. Um, I, I don't want to get too heavily inundated into PayPal. I mean, into Amazon. Uh, I, I've got enough Amazon stuff going on. Um, but, uh, yeah, check out some of the other ones if if you need that. Maybe you got your own online business going. And so that, that would be a good way for you to go as well. So check that out. Absolutely. All righty. Oh, Rob. Rob was missing me. <laughs> oh, boy. I need a little sip of water here. I need more water when I'm talking in the winter because I got my heater going. And, uh, well, throat dries out the throat. All right. Here we go on uh, one of the more important topics in my mind my way of thinking from the climatism dot blog the mind blowing costs of global warming hysteria not the mind blowing cost of global warming but the hysteria surrounding it wait global warming no you can't call it that it's climate change now why well we wanted to sell global warming to everybody but you know, 
the globe just wasn't warming. So that was a problem for us. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> when the climate... Th when the climate theory obsessed politicians and the sycophant media finally called off their global warming uh, climate change jihad uh, that's pushing the poor uh, so when will they not 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 when they did but when will they call off the the hysteria the jihad that's push punishing the poor and helping uh, without helping the planet we we're told we'd have more cyclones, not less. We were promised drought, not record rains. We were promised not less snow, not more. We were promised more extreme weather, not less. We were promised fewer crops, not record output. We were promised polar bears, fewer polar bears, not more. We were promised more global warming, not a 20-year warming pause. <laughs> when was this posted, by the way? March 21st of last year. All right. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Power prices are th are through the roof. Pensioners are unable to pay for their heating or, heating or cooling. It's time to count the shocking price we've paid for listening to these idiots, the global warming scaremongers like Tim Flannery. See, now that their panic-making has inspired global warming schemes that have hurt us infinitely more than any slight global warming could ever do if it were to ever occur, which it's not. During the height of the global warming scare, Boogie Man, around 2007, soon after Al Gore's science fiction movie, An Inconvenient Truth, aired, which was swiftly shot down as political fiction by the British High Court's uh, Judge Michael Burton, who ruled the, that errors had arisen in the context of alarmism and exaggeration. Tim Flannery uh, infamously, infamously claimed, So even the rain that falls isn't actually going to fill our dams or river systems. <laughs> That's right. In 2004, Flannery said, uh, I think there's a fair chance Perth will be the 21st century's first ghost metropolis. Its whole primary production is in dire straits, no, not the band, and the eastern states are only 30 years behind. We are one of the most physically vulnerable people on Earth, and southern Australia is going to be impacted very severely and very detrimentally by global climate change. We are going to experience conditions not seen in 40 million years. That was 2004. In 2007, he said, 2007, he said, that's because the soil is warmer because of global warming and the plants are under more stress and therefore using more moisture. So even the rain that falls is not going to actually fill our dams or river system. And that's a real worry for people in the bush. If that trend continues, then I think we're going to have a serious problem, particularly for irrigation. The one in 1,000 year drought is, in fact, Australia's manifestation of the global fingerprint of the drought caused by climate change. In May of that year, 2007, he warned that Brisbane and Adelaide uh, home to a combined a total of 3 million people could run out of water by year's end. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, I kind of pay attention a little bit to global news, and I'm pretty sure that uh, Brisbane and Adelaide and all the rest of Australia is doing just freaking fine with water. <laughs> Later that year, June, he said, over the past 50 years, Southern Australia has lost about 20% of its rainfall, which he just made up. And one cause is almost certainly global warming. Uh, by the way, uh, Moose Girl, you feeling that global warming? How's that, how's that working out for you? Anyway, 
<laughs> she's up there in Wisconsin, and it's freezing, yes. Anyway, uh, similar losses have been experienced in eastern Australia, and although the science is less certain, it is probable that global warming is behind these losses, too. Uh, the science is less certain. Uh-huh. Uh, but but the, by, by far the most dangerous trend is the decline in the flow of Australian rivers. It has fallen around 70% in recent decades. Another fabrication. So dams no longer fill even when it does rain. And later, in 2008, he warned again, the water problem is so severe at Adelaide that it may run out of water by early 2009. And then the rains came, as they always do in the land of droughts and flooding rains. By December 2008, Adelaide's reservoirs were 75% full, Perth's 40%, Sydney 63%, and Br Brisbane's reservoirs were 46% full. By 2009, uh, dams for Brisbane, Canberra, and Sydney were filled to overflowing. Presently, Adelaide reservoirs are 57%, Perth at 39, Melbourne 59, Sydney 77, and Brisbane's reservoirs are 83% full. <laughs> yeah, booze. <laughs> anyway, um, then we go on to the problem with the desalination plants. I, I could go into all the details here about the desalination plants because Australia spent a lot of money on desalination plants, in part due to the fears of global warming, uh, drying up all the rain in the rivers and all those old terrible things. Anyway, they spent $12 billion on, on desalination plants down there in southern Australia, Queensland, NSW, Victoria, and every single one of them or mothballed. Yeah, yeah. And it costs um, a lot of money to do that, just, just to mothball them uh, on a daily basis. Because, and not, not ever, not, not ever reused. They were still all brand new. And this was all done, again, as a problem connected to the global warming fear mongering which never happened it never happened uh, anyway they're still at it they're still out there you, you you see reports every day well maybe not you but I see them every day uh, various people warning of the climate change people oh you deniers that's right I'm a denier <laughs> I freely admit to being a uh, human caused climate change denier anthropogenic global warming denier because it's all a bunch of nonsense and if you look at the actual data not the manipulated data you will see that it is absolutely true that the global warming hype was just that hype fear mongering a plan designed to steal more of your money and control more of your life. That's all it was, and that was the intention of the whole, of the entire global warming slash climate change slash climate disruption strategy that they put they put into place. Uh, yeah, you go and check out, have, find out how much Al Gore himself, the the king of the media empire surrounding the global warming hype, how much money he made off of so-called carbon credits that were being traded at the uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the CME, he made a mint off of those. And then look at his lifestyle and, and any of the other big green pushers, uh, their lifestyles of, of the way they live, extravagant lifestyles, because all of that, that carbon footprint stuff that's for you. It's not for them. Do I need to say any more? You've probably heard me spew on about this over the past many years. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> uh, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> Wasting time here. <laughs> 
All right, from the MIT Technology Review, or technologyreview.com, depending on how you want to look at it, comes this article from, is there a date? There's no date on here? Uh, November 2nd, 2018. All right. Using Wi-Fi to see behind closed doors is easier than anyone thought. More easily done than anyone thought. Um, and, and I um, may have covered this on Fraker's Ball, I don't know. But uh, it seems familiar to me other than more than just reading it. Yes, it, it is all about Al Gore. <laughs> Chloe. <laughs> he, he's the evil dude. No, he, he, was just the, he was just the salesman, that's all. <laughs> just, like, just like everybody hates on Trump, but he's just the salesman. <laughs> he's, he, he's nothing. He's, 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 he's the ShamWow guy. Yeah, that's right. Anyway, but wait, there's more. <laughs> All right. Using Wi-Fi to see behind closed doors is easier than anyone thought. With nothing but a smartphone and some clever computation, researchers can now exploit ambient signals to track you inside your very own home. Wi-Fi fills our world with radio waves in your home, office, and increasingly on the city streets. Humans are bathed in a constant background field of 2.4 and 5 gigahertz radio signals. Oh, soon to be much worse under the 5G. And when people move, uh, they distort this field, reflecting and refracting the waves as they go. Now that's given more than one group of researchers an interesting idea. In theory, they say, it ought to be able, possible. They ought to be possible to use this changing electromagnetic field (EM field) uh, to work out the position, actions, and movement of you. Indeed, several groups have created imaging systems that use Wi-Fi to see through walls. True. It is true, and they can do it. But all these systems have drawbacks. For example, they rely on knowing the exact position of the Wi-Fi transmitters involved and need to be logged into the network. Uh, not necessarily true. So that they can send known signals back and forth. Uh, not necessarily true. Um, <laughs> but but it, would, it is easier that way. It says, um, that's not not possible for the ordinary snooper actually it is there's software out there designed to do exactly that uh, who might typically have access only to off-the-shelf Wi-Fi sniffers such as those built into smartphones uh, yeah there's a thing um, I, I don't know you, you may want to look it up uh, and it's called war driving and you, you drive around look <laughs> looking for uh, open open uh, Wi-Fi systems <laughs> and believe you me there's a ton of them out there. Anyway, this kind of setup is just too basic to reveal any really useful data about what goes on behind closed doors, other than the presence of the Wi-Fi network itself. At least, that's what everybody thought. Today, that changes, thanks to the work of Yamzi Zhu at the uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, and colleagues. These guys have found a way to see through walls using ambient Wi-Fi signals and any ordinary smartphone. They say this new technique allows an unprecedented invasion of privacy. Bad actors using smartphones can localize and track individuals in their home or office from outside the walls by leveraging reflections of ambient Wi-Fi transmissions. First, some uh, background. If humans were able to see the world as Wi-Fi does, it would seem a bizarre landscape. Doors and walls would be almost transparent, and almost every house and office would be illuminated from within by a very bright light bulb, the Wi-Fi transmitter. But despite the widespread transparency, uh, this world would be able to uh, this world would be hard to make sense of. That's because walls, doors, furniture, and so on reflect in bed light as well as transmitting it, so any image would be impossibly smeared with confusing reflections. But this needn't be an issue if 
if, if all you were interested in is the movement of people, which is what they're interested in. They don't care about your couch or your end table. They just want to know what you're up to. <laughs> uh, humans also distort the, the Wi-Fi light. Uh, the, the distortion and the way it moves would be clearly visible through Wi-Fi eyes, or is, or not would be, but is clearly visible through Wi-Fi eyes, even though other details could get smeared. The crazy Wi-Fi vision would clearly reveal whether anybody was behind a wall, and if so, if you were moving. The basis of the zoo in Co's Wi-Fi-based peeping Tom, it looks for changes in ordinary Wi-Fi signal that the reveal the presence of you. Yes, you! It's not hard to imagine how a malicious actor might use this to... A malicious actor, meaning government, police, military. Yeah, that's the malicious actor. That's not the ones they're talking about here, of course. But that's the those, those are the real malicious actors. Uh, it might use this to work out if a building was occupied or empty, where you are, and what they might do to you uh, through your walls, should they so decide to. The team says there are various defenses against this type of attack, as uh, such as geo-fencing. Uh, but these are difficult to implement and have limited effectiveness. The most promising form of defense seems to be adding noise to the signal. The researchers are hoping to develop this in more detail in the future. Now, now you could build a Faraday cage around your house. Uh, you'd still need a, an antenna poking through that that Faraday gauge in order to get the signal from the outside to the inside. But they wouldn't be able to track what you're doing from within the walls if, if you put uh, copper mesh sheeting all around your house. You wouldn't have to do it on the inside, uh, just, just on the outside walls. And, of course, the windows. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's important stuff um, to know, especially for those with possibly the... Uh, Paranoid mind. <laughs> uh, yeah, Rob Works puts in the chat here uh, w about uh, how to go out and find open Wi-Fi s signals using a, 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 a free open source scanner. Um, so, uh, yeah. And he, that's the one he posted is, is for Windows, but there's you can be sure there's those for Linux and Android and uh, other good operating systems. So, uh just bear that in mind, you know, uh, that we're learning about this now, or last October, whenever, um, which means it's been around for a long time and they've been able to do it, and we, we just get to find out about it at this point in time. All right. The government, malicious actor or not? I say yes. <laughs> this from uh, MOLand.com um, on uh, December 7th, 2018. Now we're getting close, December 7th. I don't know how, how much everything's in order, but uh, yeah. Third Circuit. Second Amendment is a second-rate right. The Second Amendment, in case you're not familiar with that, that is the uh, pr supposedly protected right for you, for everybody, to keep and bear arms. But according to the Third Circuit Court... Not so much. In a split decision, the three-judge panel at the Third Circuit Court of Appeals effectively ruled the Second Amendment of the Bill of Rights is a second-rate right not entitled to the full protections of other enumerated rights. Based upon what? Their opinion. The opinion was filled on the 5th of December, 2018, or filed, not filled, excuse me. Uh, the case is the Association of the New Jersey Rifle and Pistol Clubs Incorporated versus the Attorney General of New Jersey. Uh, the, 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 the two uh, majority judges followed the trend of other circuit courts, other circuits, uh, shouldn't that say circuit courts? Oh, whatever. Other circuits where the Second Amendment is being degraded and reduced to second-rate status. Only a month ago, the First Circuit ruled that the Second Amendment does not apply outside of the home. Based upon what? 
I, I've read that Second Amendment thousands of times. Literally, thousands of times. And there's nothing out there that mentions the home. <laughs> this rogue, or the rogue circuits are able to do this because the Supreme Court has been refusing to hear Second Amendment cases for the last decade. The Supreme Court only hears a limited number of cases. They are not required to hear all cases. And if a case is controversial, eh, yeah, they don't want to know. It's, 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 it's not... It's not, they, they just don't bother them with the controversial stuff. Some circuit courts are gutting the Second Amendment by claiming it's not really a right. <laughs> it's not really, well, in actuality, nothing is really a right. Uh, you, there are no rights, especially if you, if you don't stand up and, and enforce your own rights yourself. Uh, that's a whole other conversation that I'll not have here today. Um, anyway, uh, so yeah, they say it's a privilege, a privilege that the government can regulate if the government thinks. And what is the government? It's it's nothing. It's a fiction. It's made up. It was created by, by a piece of paper that some people that are all dead now signed. That's what the government is. But now you've got these other people that are filling in for the dead guys saying, we're government. You put us here. Well, I didn't put you there, but voters did. Um, at least according to the, the, the theory. <laughs> so they think it's a privilege and they think they should be able to regulate it and they have been regulating it for a long, long time. These jurists seem embarrassed by the Second Amendment. They seem to believe their job is to limit it as much as possible, rather than protect it as a fundamental right. <laughs> yeah, Vinny, that's very funny. All right, um, anyway, Joe's Judge Stefano Bebas wrote the dissenting opinion in the Third Circuit ruling he is an outstanding jurist who was appointed by Donald J. the Trumpster. At only 49 years old, he is already the 15th most cited jurist by the Supreme Court. His resume is impressive. It is easy. I don't, I don't really give a fuck all about all that. Anyway, the second he says, in, from his, his, his dissent opinion, the Second Amendment is an equal part of the Bill of Rights. We must treat the right to keep and bear arms like in like all the other enumerated rights, as the Supreme Court insisted in Heller. We may not water it down and balance it away based on our own sense of wise policy, yet the majority treats the Second Amendment differently in two ways. First, it weighs the merits of the case to pick a tier of scrutiny. Uh, that puts the cart before the horse. For all other rights, we pick a tier of scrutiny based on whether the law impairs the core right. The Second Amendment's core is the right to keep weapons for defending oneself and one's family in one's home and wherever else, he didn't say this but part I'm adding, and wherever else you may need to defend yourself, whether that be against uh, somebody that just wants to steal crap from you on the street or the government itself. The Second Amendment, uh, or the majority agrees that this is the core. So whenever a law impairs that core right, we should apply strict scrutiny, period. That is the case here. Second, the majority purports to use intermediate scrutiny. It actually uh, recreates the rational basis uh, test forbidden by Heller. It suggests that this, the, the, this record favors the government. But make no mistake, that is not what the district court found. The majority repeatedly relies on the evidence that the district court did not rely on expert testimony that the district court said was of little help. It effectively flips the burden of proof onto the challengers, treating both contested evidence and the lack of evidence conclusively favoring the government. Ah. <sighs> Whether strict or intermediate scrutiny applies, we should require real evidence that the law furthers the government's aim and is tailored to that aim. 
but at key points, the majority substitutes anecdotes in armchair reasoning for concrete proof that we demand for heightening security anywhere else. New Jersey has introduced no expert study of how similar magazine restrictions have worked elsewhere, nor did the court identify any other evidence as opposed to armchair reasoning that illuminated how this law will, be re will reduce the harm from mass shootings. So New Jersey cannot win unless the burden of proof lies with the challengers. It does not. RobWorks declines to contract. I decline the contract. Anyway, so if the Supreme Court grants a writ of senatorie, a legal term for agreeing to hear a case before the Supreme Court, and I'm sure I pronounced it wrong, Judge Bebas' reasoning is rock solid. All right, I'll let you read the rest of this for yourself here, but uh, bear in mind that your right to keep and bear arms is not seen by the government the way it's seen by you. Uh, because they don't want you having those. <laughs> they don't want you to be able to defend yourself against them. That is bad for them. <laughs> now this one I'm almost certain I covered on Freaker's Ball. Uh, but I, but I, I still had it in the list here, so I'm going to share it again with you. Uh, because I found it to be um, disturbing then and... I still find it disturbing on, on a you know small basis, but uh, be that as it may, and, and I have talked about here on this particular program before that you really, really, really don't want your kids going to public school because not only are they not learning what they need to learn, they're being totally indoctrinated with all kinds of various propaganda that you probably are not going to agree with, and and doing work there. Well, you can't be sure they're actually doing anything. And and they're still passing, right? Well, here you go. <laughs> Florida teacher Diane Torado was fired for giving zeros to students that failed to hand in their work. They didn't hand in their work. What, what grade would they get? <laughs> anyway, this was published on November 27th. Uh, 2018 and updated December 3rd, uh, 2018. It's absurd to give someone something for nothing that, and to do that, it's creating a future that is pretty darn bleak. Diane Torado was fired from her school after giving students zeros for giving for them giving her zero. An eighth grader teach eighth grade teacher in Florida has gone on the offensive against her former school after she claimed to have been fired for doling out zero grades to students who failed to hand in their homework. Social studies teacher, uh, which I don't really know what kind of stuff that is, but whatever, social studies, that's a ridiculous thing. Uh, teacher Diane Torado, 52, was fired from Westgate K-8 through School in Port St. Lucie, South Florida, after she had been working there for just two months. Apparently, the school employs a non-zero policy list. A non-zero policy. <laughs> that Toronto is said to have violated after a group of students failed to hand in one of their first major assignments of the school year. This resulted in uh, Toronto's forced departure. The assignment that ended Toronto's career called for the students to keep an explorer's notebook for two weeks in the same way that a 15th century explorer might have kept a journal in their time. Diane Toronto claims that the parents complained to her over the workloads that their kids receive and criticized the teacher of 17 years for giving 8th graders too much to handle. <laughs> Poor kitties. I got called down to the principal's office because parents were not happy with me, Toronto said in an interview. It was ruining my life for weeks. She said that during this meeting, the principal informed her of the alleged non-zero policy. I was not allowed to give anything below a 50. So do nothing. Get half as much as somebody that did everything. <laughs> did it well. 50. Uh... 
But after a group of students from her class did not hand in any work at all, Toronto felt they didn't deserve to get any credit, let alone 50%, and she gave them zero grades. I'm used to kids not handing in work, but then chasing them and, 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 and then chasing them until the report cards are in to make sure they make it up with extra credit, she said. But I, I don't give a grade for nothing. Oh, Chloe says she lived in Port St. Lucie. Oh, nice. Anyway, uh, th this this teacher. <laughs> I, 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 you know, other than the fact that she teaches social studies, um, I, I, I applaud this teacher because I, I don't really believe social studies is anything worthwhile. Um, uh, it seems it seems like a, a zero grade kind of class to have, but th that's that's beside the point. Um, but but the fact oh, I'm, I'm getting a phone call here. Let's see if we can answer it. Hello, you're live on Grim Leftovers with Grimner. They hung up. Well, so much for that. <laughs> All right. Uh, anyway, there's more to that article there, <laughs> and and you can uh, take your time and read it should you so desire. All right, there we go. <laughs> Oh, boy. I'm not going to have... Well, I'll probably have to run a little over. No big deal. I got extra time. Nobody's coming up after me. All right. Come on. Load, 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 load. Yeah, I, mean, I, 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 I uh, unloaded all my browser things, and so some of these sites take a, a moment to load, which gives me a chance to have a little drink of water. All right, that one's not loading. I don't know why that one's not loading. Let's try a uh, let's try another site here. All right, this one loaded right up, so we'll just keep waiting for that other one to load while I share this one with you, because there's not really a whole lot here to share with you, other than the fact that if you like um, books, if you like to read books, there's a lot of freebies out there, uh, eBooks, free free eBooks that you can download that are in the public domain. That you don't have to worry about anybody coming after your ass for. So uh, this on motherboard that that vice dot com, it says how to download the books that just entered the public domain. Public domain day was yesterday, which means when was this article? Uh, January second of this year. So uh, yeah, so January first this year was public domain day, apparently, and uh, you were probably hung over. So here's how to download the tens of thousands of books that became legal to download for free in this year. Starting at midnight on January 1st, tens of thousands, tens of thousands, that might take you a while to read, of books as well as movies, songs, and cartoons entered the public domain, meaning that you can download, share, or repurpose these works for free without retribution under U.S. scamming copyright law. Why, why is this not loading? I don't know why that, that, that one didn't load. All right, we'll try it again. Uh, anyway, so, um, and get this, in case you missed it, or weren't unaware of it, I should say. Per the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act of 1998. Sonny Bono, thanks, Sonny. We got you, babe. Uh, corporate creations like Mickey Mouse can be restricted under copyright law for 120 years. But per amendment to the act, Works published between 1923 and 1977 can enter the public domain 95 years after their creation. That means that this is the first year since 1998 that a large number of works have entered the public domain. Uh, be that as it may, the link will be in the Post Post Show blog, and here's the link for you um, should you uh, desire to actually go there and check out all the cool stuff that you can actually download, because there's a lot of cool stuff, you know. Yes, indeed. All right, now let me try to get back to this here. See if it'll load this time. All right, there it is. It comes came, came right up. Terrific. I don't know why it didn't load the first time, but there it is. <laughs> this article on futurism.com states, you, you personally, have no idea what artificial intelligence really does. <laughs> <laughs> the world of AI is full of hype and deception. 
And most of you remember Sophie. Uh, they, they call her Sophia here. I'm pretty sure it's just Sophie, though. Anyway, when Sophia, the robot, first switched on, the world couldn't get enough. It had a cheery personality. It joked with late-night hosts. It had a facial expressions that echoed our own. Here it was. Finally. A robot plucked straight out of science fiction. The closest thing to true, quote unquote true, artificial intelligence that we had ever seen. There's no doubt that Sophia, like I said, I'm pretty sure it's Sophie, is an impressive piece of engineering. Uh, parents slash collaborating tech companies, Hanson Robotics and Singularity.net. Singularity. Uh -huh. Still waiting on that one equipped Sophia with sophisticated neural networks that gave Sophia the ability to learn from people and to detect and uh, mirror emotional responses, which makes it seem like the robot has a personality. It didn't take a whole lot to convince people of Sophia's apparent humanity. Many of Futurism's own articles refer to the robot as her. Piers Morgan, the idiot that he is, even decided to try his luck uh, for a date and or sexually harass the robot, depending on how you want to look at it. No, he's a perv and he was trying to, he was trying to get it, get it, get, get in there with the robot. Oh yeah, she said. Oh yeah, she's basically alive, Hanson Robotics CEO David Hanson said of Sophia during the 2017 appearance on Jimmy Fallon's Tonight Show. And while Hanson Robotics never officially claimed that Sophia contained artificial uh, general intelligence, the comprehensive lifelike AI that we see in science fiction, the adoring and uncritical press that followed all those public appearances only helped the company grow. But as Sophia became more popular, people took a little closer look and cracks emerged. It became harder to believe that Sophie, Sophia was the all-encompassing artificial intelligence that we all wanted her to be. They call it it, but I'm calling it a her. Because she looks like a she. <laughs> Over time, articles that might have once oohed and awed about Sophia's conversational skills eh, came a little more focused on the fact that they were partially scripted in advance. Anyway, um, <laughs> I guess I'm running out of time here. Uh, or at least the time that I want to spend with y'all. I mean, uh, spend doing this program with you here, <laughs> not spend with you. I love spending time with you, really. Uh, anyway. <laughs> There's that one. Uh, I, have, I, have an, I have another one from the very same site. Um, oh, and it's got an internal server error. It's not going to load for me. Futurism seems to be having a problem with presentism because it's not loading my site. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. On this article, since it what what, what it, it, it gonna load gonna load, eh, maybe not. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll save this um, particular link uh, to put into the post show blog, and I'll just tell you what it's about because it's it's actually pretty cool if you go through it and read it. Once their servers operating, a toy sized laser wielding robot is here to kill mosquitoes. And again, I think I did cover that on. On Freaker's Ball, but it was still in my list, and, and so I was going to share it here with you. But I, 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 don't, I don't really need to. But we are going to close out with a Nature.com article um, from 9th of January this year. Van Meter! Welcome. All right, for, so here it is from Nature.com, and uh, many of you who could be interested in this particular information. Earth's magnetic field is acting up. And geologists don't know why. Erratic motion of the north magnetic pole. Uh, force, now, does the south magnetic pole not move around? Is that what I'm to understand here? Or does it move around at a, at a more unerratic uh, way? Uh, anyway, erratic motion of the north magnetic pole forces experts to update model that aids in global navigation. So, yeah, I don't know about that. Anyway, uh, January 9th um, update. The release of the World Magnetic Model has been postponed to 30th of January due to ongoing U.S. government shutdown. 
Aww. <laughs> so on January 30th, I guess we can get that uh, uh, world magnetic model. So uh, we'll look forward to that. Anyway, something strange is going on at the top of the world. Earth's north mag magnetic pole has been skittering away from Canada and towards Siberia, driven by liquid iron sloshing within the planet's core. The magnetic pole is moving so quickly that it has forced the world's geomagnetism experts into a rare move. On the 15th of January, now 30th of January, they are set to update the world's magnetic model, which describes the planet's magnetic field and underlies all modern navigation, from the systems that steer ships at sea to Google Maps on smartphones. In the most recent version of the model, which came out in 2015, was supposed to last until 2020. Eh, we're not that far off. But the magnetic field is changing so rapidly that researchers have to fix the model now. The error is increasing all the time, says some guy's name I can't pronounce, a geomagneticist at the University of Colorado Boulder and the National Oceanic, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration uh, National Centers for Environmental Information. The problem lies partly with the moving pole and partly with other shifts deep within the planet. Liquid churning in the Earth's core generates most of the magnetic field. I wonder if they're going to blame global warming on the Earth core sloshing around, <laughs> which varies over time as the deep flows change. In 2016, for instance, there was part of the magnetic field, uh, the part of the magnetic field temporarily accelerated uh, deep under the north, northern South America and eastern Pacific Oceans. Satellites such as the European Space Agency Swarm Mission tracked the shift. And by early last year, the World Magnetic Model was in trouble. Researchers from NOAA and the British Geological Survey in Edinburgh uh, had, done, uh, had been doing their annual check of how well the model was capturing all the variations in the Earth's magnetic field. They realized it was so inaccurate that it was about to exceed the acceptable limit for navigational errors. What is the acceptable limit for navigational errors? Suppose you're, you're off by... 100 miles on a 10,000 mile journey? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, the wandering pole. Uh, well, that was an interesting situation we found ourselves in, says Chuliat. What's happening? The answer is twofold, he reported last month in a meeting of the American Geophysical Union in D.C. First, that in 2016, uh, geomagnetic pulse between uh, beneath South America came at the worst possible time just after the 2015 uh, update to the World Magnetic Model. This meant that the Earth's magnetic field had lurched just after the latest update in ways that the planners had not anticipated. Now, now let me just say this. In this day, in this era, modern times, where we live now, 2019, they should be able to have a dynamic model, one that automatically adjusts itself to the current position of the of the pole and the conditions around the planet dealing with the magnetic field. They, they should not have to periodically go in there and update it. It should be automatic. I could write that software for them. <laughs> anyway, it says here, second, the motion of the North Magnetic Pole made the problem worse. The pole wanders in unpredictable ways that have fascinated explorers and scientists since James Clark Ross first measured it in 1831 in the Canadian Arctic. In the mid-90s, it picked up speed from around 15 kilometers per year to around 55. That's uh, almost fourfold there. By 2001, it had entered the Arctic Ocean, where in 2007, the team, including Juliet, landed on an aeroplane, aeroplane it says here, aeroplane, on the sea ice and attempted to locate the pole. In 2018, the pole crossed the international dateline into the eastern hemisphere. It sounds like it's this thing's it's going on a big old wander about, a, a walkabout. <laughs> anyway, the ge geometry of the Earth's magnetic field magnifies the, the model's errors in places where the, the field is changing quickly, such as the North Pole. The fact that the pole is going fast makes this region prone to large errors. 
anyway, it goes on to talk about a few more things here in the article, but uh, you, you get the drift. Huh? 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 You catch that? You get the drift. <laughs> oh, I crack me up. <laughs> All right, that, that's going to wrap it up for the stories here today. Uh, let me mention uh, the upcoming schedule on RLM Radio for y'all. Tomorrow at uh, 1 p.m. Eastern is Flash Somebody doing his show called In a Perfect World. Then on Wednesday evening and Friday evening, both at 7 p.m. Eastern, is Grammy and Grammy's Rocket Chair. So uh, look forward to that on Thursday night. Uh, again, Flash Somebody uh, doing his other, another one in, you know, one of his two other shows called 20% Off at 7, no, oh, 6 p.m. Eastern. 6 p.m. Eastern. Wait, is that right? <laughs> Somewhere right in there. Check the schedule. Uh, I think it's 6 p.m. Eastern. Might be 5 p.m. Eastern. Uh, anyway, I think it's 6 p.m. Eastern. So so check out uh, Flash's show, uh, 20% Off on Thursday night, afternoon, depending where you are. Uh, then on uh, Friday, Vin E, uh, Vincent Easley the second or two, Junior, depending on how you want to refer to him, uh, he does a show at 1 p.m. Eastern uh, called A Ponder Gander, and uh, he's been doing a lot of talk about the the Bundy situation out there in Nevada and uh, the stuff going on with him, and it's, it's not a lot, it's not very nice stuff. I mean, they they were all freed, uh, let loose. With prejudice. And then suddenly the government says, no, no, we want to take another look at that. We want to put them under double jeopardy. So uh, check out Vinny for that information. Uh, and then on Friday night at 11 p.m. Eastern is myself and the Mighty Moose Girl doing the Freakers Ball. And, of course, on Saturday, as always, noon Eastern is the Dork Table with Flash and maybe guests. Uh, I guess that remains to be seen. Um, but, uh, yeah, the Dork Table with Flash. And I'll be on Sunday morning with the blues right here, noon Eastern. Uh, three three hours worth of blues for you. It's awesome, man. We play trivia right here in the chat. And trivia is a good old time. And then Hal Anthony behind the woodshed at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon o'clock Pacific. Behind the woodshed, opening up the big old can. Oh, whoop a ass. Yeah. So uh, I guess that's all. Oh, yeah. By the way, like I said, uh, this uh, Friday officially starts the reallibertymedia.com fundraiser, annual fundraiser. We do it once a year. That's it. We're not out there every every year begging for your money or every month begging for your money. We just do it one one month a year to try and get enough to cover the server fees, the the hosting companies, the domain domain registrations, the shoutcasts. Uh, there's no pay for my time or any of the other hosts' time. That's all done because we love you. Oh, something like that. Anyway, thank you all for tuning in. I'll be back again next Monday with another edition of Grimm's Leftovers. Grim Leftovers. See, I, 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 people, I see people writing Grimm's Leftovers all the time. It's not Grimm's Leftovers. It's Grim Leftovers. Anyway, but but so I, I, I got caught up in that. Anyway, peace! <laughs>